Check, check. Everyone hearing an echo? There shouldn't be an echo. How about now? Try now. Hello. Still an echo? Yeah, getting an echo. Hmm. Okay, well, not too bad, though. That may just be a thing that we have to kind of deal with, which sometimes pops up with these sorts. Go ahead and mute my mic. And uh, you go ahead and answer the question, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to it. Yeah, so I, when I play um, MMOs or games these days, guys, it's like I, you start to play, and almost immediately you're confronted with a really simple grind system that um, is going to look like your rest of the journey in the game with better and better gear, and maybe you go up in level. Um, it almost feels like the entire game is laid out for you after the first 15, 20 minutes of of play and that that's just real boring to me um it's a real prop immersed in the world oh this is my daughter say hi leah hi. and remember leah honey this is a very important thing and you were supposed to occupy yourself in the other room <laughs> no <laughs> My daughter wants to know if she has enough money for an iPhone. Does that answer any questions about Miranda's for everybody? Um, so I, what I want is I want to recapture, if possible, the spirit and the feeling that I had um, in the early days of, of, of RPG and MMO playing, and especially tabletop Dungeons and Dragons, um, where you were just you're just on edge when you play. It was exciting because your life was at stake. I mean, if you were playing with the right, you know, with a hardcore, you know, dungeon master and you found the entrance to a dungeon, you didn't even walk up and throw the door open. You were scared. You were talking about who's going to approach it, you know, who's got the best skills. Okay, let's, let's, let's open it up. Let's, let's start to walk in. Okay, everyone, slow down, slow down, you know. Every room was filled with danger. You never knew what you were going to expect. And that's, that's really important to me. And if you died in Dungeons & Dragons and the Dungeon Master reach over, and you know some of them I knew, they just rip your page in half and kick you out of the room. You're dead. That's it. With that kind of spirit and risk on the line when you're going out into the world, you, you're just excited the whole time. You don't know what's going to happen next. Every decision matters. And I want it to feel more that way um so we're going to do that in, in a in a few different areas but having the world be kind of a living simulation i think is automatically going to heal a lot of um of what makes other mmos boring um, you won't know where monsters are and you won't know where creatures are in the forest um because we won't know in these other games and you know in, typical software development, you pick a point over here in this world and you say, okay, this is where we're going to spawn this guy and these three other support guys. They're going to be standing around a fire. Um, if you kill them, they're going to respawn again in five minutes. You know, that means everyone knows everything that's going to happen all the time. That means dungeons, you know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, up here on the room on the left, there's three guys. Over there in the room on the left, there's two. Avoid the room on the right. Uh, that sucks. The treasure chest sucks. You just know everything already ahead of time. Um, and that that's just really boring. So I really want to set up a living simulation. I, I really have goals, um, but we don't know, know exactly what they're going to do. I want them to live, eat, get sick, breed, attack, um, and just kind of let the simulation. So anytime as a game developer, when you don't know exactly how the world is going to shape up or what players are going to do when they enter the game, that is extremely exciting. Um, and that's probably the most exciting thing for me as, as a developer. I'm excited to play Miranda's myself, and I think you guys will too, because you won't know what you're going to expect.
and fun and, and very different than charging in. Oh, I died. Oh, I respawned. I walked back. I, you know, the typical grind you feel in other games, I think. Yeah. One of the things. Question, Mel. <laughs> um, one of the things that I, that really intrigues me about this concept is the ability. that you get where you literally run into dungeons like today in games you run and jump through the it's very uh very fast paced so let's go ahead and um will there be permadeath is that something that you would like to discuss and and before before he dives into this um I, I really a lot of thoughts on this one, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, but before before you dive in, I would like to say at this point in time, a lot of this is stuff that 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 is in the planning phases. So so whatever is said may change in the future, but this is the direction that we're looking at going. So I just want to be very very clear on that. So with that, without further ado, give us your encyclopedic thoughts on permadeath. Um, so I think permadeath, uh, and let's define permadeath for a second. And I, I think what you're asking is, um, I go through the character creation process. I enter the world. Maybe I'm even level 30 or 40. I'm very high power. I got all my gear. I got everything. Um, and a rock falls on me. Do I have to go back to the character creation process and completely start over? Um, the answer to that is no, because that's just, that's probably a little too hardcore, I feel like. that's That might not be fun. Also, there's a grand array of glitches and bugs that can possibly occur um, in a game or just with your internet connection. I don't think anyone would want to build up a cool character, their internet drops for a second, and you know when they log back in they're dead they've they've lost everything and they have to start the game can completely over again um, so i definitely wouldn't go that hardcore because i think it it just sucks um there's other things i've seen in, in i mean even in world of warcraft you know when they when they first came out there was places you could just kind of fall off on a cliff and you're you're stuck behind a rock you can't move you know, if there's permadeath and there's monsters nearby, you're stuck behind a rock, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You, you could die and lose everything. So, you know, our game will be about as bulletproof as we can make it. But in case you lose your internet connection, in case there's just a maybe a glitch in some of the level terrain, I think permadeath would just be too hardcore and probably just too sucky of a mechanic. Um, there will be, there will need to be significant penalties for dying and i i haven't settled on exactly what those are yet but um if there aren't significant penalties you won't care about running out into a dark forest and when you see a hero who's high level and has really great gear it's nothing to be respected it's just oh you know in other games it's like oh well he's obviously played a shitload can i say cuss words i probably shouldn't say cuss words unless should i um you know it needs to be seeing a high level player and someone living and surviving and leveling up to become a true great hero in the land of Miranda's needs to be a big deal and needs to be something that everyone respects. Um, so I'd say the game will get as hardcore as you want it, depending on how hard and deep you want to start probing into dungeons and what high level monsters do you want to try to go for and, um, uh, yeah, you know, the more risk you put yourself in, the greater the reward. But um, when you die, you're not going to lose everything. You're not going to lose everything. Uh, you certainly aren't going to lose anything you have on the blockchain, right? I mean, we couldn't claw that back from you guys even if we wanted to. So there's there's no way to leave behind a uh, – not really. You know, There's no way to leave behind a you – know, a sword that that you own, um, you know, you'll still kind of have that have that gear forever. Um, but you know, it's possible that you could. 
it's possible that, you know, you could lose the things that you've acquired on that particular journey or mission, unless you made it back in there, found your body again. Um, I wouldn't rule out, um, you know, pretty severe penalties for, quest um, maybe you lose experience points uh, when you die uh, that was that alone made me scared to walk around the world of, of everquest on the dark and your friends are calling you over to it then was going to kill you um, but it was exciting i mean it was feel and be a risky world, but a, I want you to feel like you are truly in a simulated fantasy uh, land uh, with all of the risks that would go along with it if we all were there in real life. So I would say think of this as a fantasy simulator. Um, those, are, those are my thoughts on that. I really like that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer a question that somebody asked. I saw it uh, go flying by as everyone was asking questions, but um, will the uh, potions drop at 4 p.m.? The potion stands will go on sale at 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that's already automated and in the system, so they will just go live um, at exactly that time. So, uh, yeah. We, we will probably still be talking, but fortunately, since you're probably listening to us on a computer, you can listen to us and go buy a potion if you would like, or a potion stand if you would like. Um, let's... Can I can I elaborate? Can I elaborate something to Mr. Brink? Absolutely, man. Um, kind of playing on this, you know, this this concept of what what would it be like to really simulate a fantasy world? Um, I I like the ideas that I like the idea that that families could play this game together too. Um, you know, there'd be members of your family that all they want to do is adventure and try to go into, you know, a dungeon and get some loot or kill a creature they've heard of and, you know, deep in this dark forest. But I like the idea, too, that, you know, there there could be other family members being merchants, um, you know, farmers and crafting things that are useful for, um, you know, for their team or guild or family to help them with their adventure or to grow their their wealth. So I, I think, you know, again... Is Miranda's hardcore? Don't think about the rules that we are going to employ to make it hardcore or not. Think about it more like if we all lived in a D and D fantasy world, um, it would not be super dangerous um, to be in a town or a village. Um, it'd be pretty safe. It would be very dangerous to go out into the forest uh, at night. So. Um, kind of like, you know, when you're playing town star, I'm, I'm trying to reference a, a reality and in Miranda's it's going to have that same feel. I'm, I'm hoping if we have a question about what the rules should be, it's going to be to reference what the reality of having a creature in a forest might, might look like. Does that make sense guys? Throw some things in discord to say yes, or thumbs up if that, <laughs> if that makes sense to you. We're going to try to simulate a fantasy world, and there will be parts of it that will be very dangerous to walk into. I like it. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to play. Um, I'm going to answer a quick question here from Zarek. Uh, as you intend to solve the problem of high Ethereum gas rates, do you have something in mind? Yes, we definitely do have several things in mind, uh, and it's actually kind of funny to, to watch the Discord update because we're talking way ahead of them hearing it. Um, but yes, we're, we are going to go ahead and uh, we have several different solutions in mind that will fix the, uh, or not fix the Ethereum gas prices. Ethereum gas prices are always going to be Ethereum gas prices. They're gonna be whatever they are. Uh, but we do have some second level or second layer scaling solutions that will make things much better for the, uh, for the player and the users of our NFTs and whatnot. So that should be helpful. Hey Jason, let me let me answer a question I just saw in here. Go for it. Do you have something in mind for shared NFTs? I the way, the way that I think about it is we want to create a platform 
for people to do what they want to do. So if we succeed at this, you can create your own shared NFTs. We won't be having to do uh, anything on our end because you'll have the power and you'll have the control on your end to do what you want with it. Yeah, there's when you guys, you know, you guys own things and that's pretty awesome. Um, and to riff on that with Eric for a second, there's lots of things that we've discussed, you know, again, we're trying to simulate a fantasy world. You know, if you woke up tomorrow and you were in a fantasy world, what would you be able to do? And that's, that's really, that's really what we're going to try to do. And if you owned something in that world, when you woke up in the morning, could you lend it to a friend or could somebody rent it from you or could you gift it to somebody or, you know, we're, we're trying to do that. We're trying to do that. And that was the spirit and the soul, honestly, of, of I think that'd be a really interesting um, mechanic. I'm hoping that I can convince McCarthy to have any unsold citadels as um, as like ruins of an ancient land or uh, an especially challenging um, area for people to venture in. I want a citadel. I want a Me. citadel too. <laughs> we can have our own citadel. We, well, can you, we, we can't afford citadel. Okay, that's true. Sad, sad, sad face. Um, I want to ask answer a question. Uh, it was Martin, I believe, that asked it. Um, what are expectations for player base size compared to Townstar, and do you have any more big partnerships that are aimed at getting more RPG people in, especially from outside crypto? Um, this is a very important question because uh, it, it really – kind of centers on what we are trying to do. A lot of game companies that are focused on blockchain gaming have a focus specifically on only blockchain people. For us, we're always game first, okay? So it's all about creating a good player experience, about creating awesome games, um, and about developing something that people really, really, really want to play. So um, player base comparison, um, I would say comparing the the daily active users of townstar to what we want things to be in the future it it should be significantly larger because you know townstar is right now still kind of in the the blockchain gaming space we want this to be 
uh, exponentially larger in terms of the number of players who are able to to play. So I think it's worth mentioning, Jason, how many uh, unique visitors we had to Gala last month. Yeah, we had almost uh, 700,000 unique visitors uh, to to the Gala website and to our platform last month. Um, So, you know, not all of them were players, but that's a lot of people. And that was um, in December. That was before the first Citadel sold the Polyon. So I'm anticipating that there's going to be a lot uh, more... Uh, attention coming in that direction and in terms of partnerships yes of course we have things that are uh, are, are in progress right now um, can't say anything about them yet but uh, hopefully we have something that will be uh, uh, some news that will be released here fairly shortly um, let's see here Will you be able to have multiple land deeds in use in game at the same time is that something you yeah. want to Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, again, guys, you know, if you were, you know, if you, like, you know, I, I, I think the question is, like, you know, if you have three ranching hamlets, can you lay them all down in the world next to each other and kind of own and control all three? Uh, the answer to that's absolutely yes. It's not limit one per customer. You're just canic behind... your skills and abilities, there's going to be buffs uh, for some way, and the buffs just get greater and greater and greater depending on how awesome your land deed is. But if if you, um, let's say you owned two citadels, um, it's possible, you know, let's, let's say you own, let's take an extreme example. I own 50 deeds. I lay them all down. Do I get buffs from all that might be a little hard to do. Might need to do something like in, in every home um, that a land deed is associated with it, there's a shrine of some sort. You know, there's something, you know, that you tap above the threshold of the door, let's say, that connects your buffs um, to that particular property. Um, might need to do something. line them up side by side if you wanted to and do things like that. Here's a question that I'm hoping uh, we could talk a little bit about, uh, Michael. Uh, Stever82 says, are we going to earn Gala like in Townstar? Or is it the currency for the game? If someone else knows, let me know. Okay, so Gala is always going to be the primary currency. That's an easy one to answer. But what can you earn in terms of NFTs inside of Miranda's? What happens when you make it to the bottom of a dungeon or you defeat a mega boss? Um, so high on our priority list, guys, is exploring blockchain tech that allows us to more freely transfer things to you without radical gas prices. Um, so I think what I like the idea of, even if we were to go, even if let's say we had a, a more costly, you know, blockchain tech like Ethereum incorporated into the game, I like the idea that um, you would get, you could get big, huge things. Like let's say you killed the the boss monster in the bottom of the dungeon, which, by the way, is going to be shockingly difficult. Um, let's say you kill him. There's going to be something that that you're likely to get that could be on chain. But the vast majority of items that I think you're, I think a better system is going to be that you get a lot of things when you're out there in the world. Um, But it is when you take them to crafting, the crafting steps where you combine all of these things you've collected in the world, which likely could just be living on the database so we could give them to you guys back and forth more freely and and super quickly. the crafting step would be the opportunity to take it out of the DB world and and put it on chain. Uh, Almost like, you know, when you get a new bicycle, you're supposed to register it or a new computer, you know, it's like who the hell registers stuff, but it's kind of a way for you to register it and have it be yours and have it be yours forever and buy, sell and trade it and be able to pull it out of the game and have it on the secondary market, I guess, if you wanted to do that. Um, But um, that's, 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 I think a pretty good model. You know, and uh, Michael, I, 
I think I have a feeling uh, that we'll we'll end up having special events where you know we might drop a sword or oh yeah you know mm -hmm. and you know it's off to the races first person to the bottom of the dungeon gets it absolutely or the top of the mountain yeah or somewhere in this marsh is hidden a there's there's going to be some serious quests and puzzles involved in in this and i think that uh, the cool thing about this is we're we're limited only by creativity, which means that we're totally not limited because we've got that in spades. Um, got a quick question here. I want to bounce over to Theta really quick. Um, this is from Panda Pops, um, who has popped up in Discord a couple times. Um, would you be able to get started and build up in the game without having buildings or land or any initial purchases? Is that a thing that you can do? Will we be able to drop in as somebody who is not part of the the gaming world at all, haven't bought a deed, haven't bought a house, and play and have fun. What do you think? I think you can play and have fun, um, but you are not going to own a house if you don't own a house. You wouldn't be able to build a house if you don't, if you don't own a house. Um, if you wanted to be, I mean, we, we have to do that just to keep the buildings and the deeds truly special. If we were selling these buildings and deeds and that was a big part of our game and there was scarcity associated with that, but anyone could jump in the game and get some stones and some sticks together and build a house, I, I don't know. You know, we just wouldn't, we just wouldn't have that. So if you want to own a house, you got to get a house. Um, but you can jump into the game and you can adventure and you can be shopping in town at other players' shops and you can upgrade your character and you can do all of those things. It's likely you'd belong to a guild at some point um, or a group of, of players. And uh, any player that owns a house uh, or a deed is, you know, I like the idea that they can have keys. And that's how they get in and out and they can give those keys to to other people and let them share in, in what is inside that, that home, you know, chests and uh, beds and you know, whatever else they have in there. Michael, can I, can I add one thing? Yeah. yeah. To this? Um, yeah. Hell, let's see, what's his name? Hell or Red Fox. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, asks, would a new player with no NFTs be able to earn enough rewards to become a landowner? And I, I'll just tell you my, my sort of philosophical position on this. And, you know, Michael's going to have the final say on this, but my view is that, you know, in any MMORPG, there's a certain amount of uh, grinding that ends up having to happen for like crafting recipes or or whatever. And it's been something that I've I've envisioned for many for many years now that somebody in you know one part of the world might uh, create something that somebody in another part of the world finds really valuable and then sell it to them. So I can I can very much imagine someone becoming a new player, doing some tasks that maybe this other player who's been playing for a while doesn't want to do, and and then doing that enough times that they maybe they yes they have uh, earned enough to become a landowner because they've made some really you know smart trades. You know we we see this mm -hmm. in the Discord all the time. You just got to go to the marketplace. I know there are people making thousands of dollars a month on our, uh, you know, NFTs and trading and selling them. In fact, uh, I, I, I believe this is the case until this last week, that many weeks our players make more money than we do as a company. And I want to see that continue in all of our games. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely think that inside the game, your hard work could translate into things that are valuable for, for other people uh, out in the world, especially higher level players. Um, so I, I completely agree with, with what Eric is saying, and I, I think that's, that's a goal of the game, a potential goal for a type of player. What I think is cool is to think about the world and to think about entering it and seeing you know where the gaps are. Um, I loved the auction house in World of Warcraft for a while. You know, I just did nothing but harvest and buy and sell, um, you know, buy low, 
would sell high packs of silk and stuff, try to corner the market and get an unbelievable amount of gold from, from very wealthy elder players that are just looking to level up their crafting skill. That was fun. You know, that was, that was cool. So I want the game to have those vectors. I want, I want there to be a lot of different types of players in it trying to do something in the world. There'll be a lot of adventurers and, um, but yeah, a lot of merchants and farmers and just people. Hey, Michael, the, the idea of people renting things seems like it's coming up a lot. I see Evie uh, in here asking, even the level of a homestead could be rented. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, you're, so as a deed owner, you know, you're kind of renting out the plots of your deed to people that want to put buildings there. Um, I don't. It, it seems very possible, you know, from a smart contract standpoint to, you know, rent out their, their building to others too. I think that, I mean, it should be possible. I feel like you'd, you should be able to do that in, in real life. I don't know why we, we would block that or prevent that here. We just need to figure out a good way to do it. I like this one. Uh, Crypto. Do and- landowners... Are you reading that one, Crypto Dude? <laughs> well, actually, it's Tanzo Fett. He says, will you put a call out for quest writers and other in-lore components? Mm. That touches a lot of things, that question. Um, I think, so first off, I, I definitely think we need a quest system that allows players to create their own quests and assign rewards for them. Uh, I think that's just really fun. And I think there's going to be a call for that. You know, if you're trying to build something really special or, you know, craft some sort of incredible shield or sword, um, you know, you might need five rubies. They're incredibly hard to get. Um, and if someone can bring one to you, you will, you know, pay them for something. So I, I think we'll need a player-based quest system because I think it's really fun. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, item lore, to me, that's just a drop-in. I, I think, I think if you craft a lower-level item, it's going to say, you know, iron dagger of of daggerness, and that's it. But let's say you cross certain thresholds, and the item gets into like legendary tiers. I think when you craft that item that you should be able to enter in all sorts of, like a description of an item, a background of it. Um, you know, maybe there should be information on, you know, where it was forged, you know, it should be a big special thing that you get to customize in all sorts of ways. Um, so I, you know, I, I think players should be able to certainly enter in their own item descriptions um, for for things when they create them. This is an easy Assume. one. How about this one? Will Will you be able to enchant your weapons? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. But it's not going to be easy, you know. I I I don't want Mirandas to be um, a world that. Everything around you is just magical all the time. Everything's just magic. So on an extreme end, like think of think of Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, in Lord of the Rings, it's likely that you know ninety percent of that population in that world would, you know, be born, uh, you know, live and and die without ever seeing anything magic in their life. You know, certainly never touching a magical item. Um, I don't think we would be that sparse with it, but, but I like the idea that, you know, if there is a glowing sword, there's very, very, very few of them. They are incredibly special. You know, how special would Excalibur be in some of these games that, you know, or like World of Warcraft, you know, Excalibur, like a magic sword of some kind, like, yeah, big deal. They're all over the place. Some are better than others. And, that's not that fun. I think it's I think it's cooler when if you own something magic, you are extremely powerful uh, or wealthy. 
somebody was asking about timelines. I know we had we had talked a little bit about that before this call. Yeah, I mean we're we're hoping to be um, playing playing Mirandis internally and maybe even be able to invite some people to to be coming in and playing um, by the end of this year. And that's pretty aggressive for an MMO, but we've got some. I think we've got some pretty solid plans to to um, expedite the the development process. A very important question, um, Michael. Are you Jesus? Zero really <laughs> wants to know. It's it's, it's very important. Oh, is it the look? Hey, Michael. I'm uh, I'm answering some questions here in the Discord. Uh, somebody was asking how how we're going to do this all on a browser, and I'm saying we're not. It's probably going to be a downloadable. Yeah, we're. I mean, I just don't. With with Townstar guys, you know, it's easy. It's easier for us because if you're playing in a browser, you know, you essentially have to download the game every time from from scratch. A lot of the time when you play, with Miranda's having so much content, that would be an incredible challenge. Trying to be as smart as possible with how big our executable would be, and I, I think it'll be a real challenge. I, I think we've talked about and are looking into some of the new streaming technologies. I think that might there could be something there. We might be able to to stream the game to you know mobile or lower end devices, but that that technology I feel like is getting more mature, and in a year or so, uh, I think we'll we'll know for sure about how that tech is is shaping up but i think we're gonna have to count on at least for now there being there being a download you know you're gonna have to download something and the question around steam that i see here by by kenji uh that's kind of that's going to be a tbd you know we'll we'll probably talk to steam and see how it goes i'm not totally sure what their policy is on crypto games um Certainly don't want to have to uh, impose a twenty percent tax or whatever they they, they do. Um, and so, I mean, I think the plan is to just launch it, the download the download directly from our, our site. Yeah, we're never we're never closed off to other ways to get the game out there. I don't think, guys. You know, it's just there the terms of service of so many of these places um, just make it such that if there's a way. For if there's a you know if they can't get their hands on the pie and know exactly every penny being spent in the game and they're not getting their thirty percent cut, then you get kicked off the system immediately. And we can't with you know blockchain tech and crypto being so new, we just can't uh, you know we can't bet the business and bet the farm on a on a platform that could kill us or turn us off. So by launching it by Gala, you know, and from Gala as our platform, you know, we can, um, you know, we can shape it up. We can shape things in a way and explore things in a way that we wouldn't be able to on other platforms, I don't think. So um, if there's other platforms out there that end up being very open and friendly to blockchain, is it possible you could download or launch the game from there? Yeah, I, I know, it's, it's possible. But... I think I like the idea of Mirandus just being in the game section of Gala.games and you hit play and play it. Um, I see it. And there's Crypto Dude has uh, fired this one off a few times. I want to answer this one. Do landowners have to pay taxes to the king? Um, I have some. some... No. You. I don't think. It's not in the plans right now for deed owners to pay the king for you know because the king could be on the on the other side of the world and you could put your farming hamlet over there on the left it's the buildings within your land deed uh that you know those little plots of land where players can put their buildings they are going to have to pay whatever it is you set to have their building there for some period of time and you might set it for nothing maybe to begin with to try to populate your town up and try to get a lot of traffic and, and, and people moving through there. And then, you know, as their kind of building leases um, end up, you know, or, or end, 
after some period of time, you might say, hey, I need a little bit, you know, in order for you to have your building here longer. And you guys can negotiate that as, as part of growing a successful, you know, town or settlement. But the king will have an extremely large piece of land. I mean, you've seen the designs for like the Archduke and stuff. I mean, you can you can imagine a citadel is going to be certainly larger than that, uh, you know, probably 2x larger at least. Whatever we think we can kind of manage inside the world of, of the game. So there'll be many, 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 many buildings, and that's where the king can, that's where the king is is going to make out just fine. I don't think there's, you know, a farming hamlet guy on the other side of the world is not going to have to pay anything to to the king. I think oh, one of there's the, there's two questions that have come up that I think are kind of interesting. One is PvP, and the other is mm -hmm. lore. You know, is, the, are you will there be lore? that players can explore and find out and learn more about in the game? Like, will there be a central a central story of some kind and, um, you know, big... Yes, for sure. I mean, absolutely. It's not just going to be... It's not just, you know... If we're going to put in... If we're going to put in and generate different creatures and cultures of these creatures um there's going to be a story behind all of them for sure yeah it's one of the things that i'm i'm really looking forward to about this because this is something that i really really enjoy and i've i've uh, enjoyed doing uh, most of my life in terms of coming up with lore and creating you know backgrounds and things like that um if uh if possible, I'd like to bounce back to the, the last question about, about the taxation really quick. Um, one of the things that we want to do is enable freedom, okay? So if you, if you as a player want to, you know, connect with a, uh, a Citadel owner, and one of the things that, um, that, that has been discussed in the past is that, that various Citadels have certain uh, buffs that are given to them. That you you receive based on uh, based on you know the the specific characteristics. So for example, Citadel of the Sun has a, a wisdom uh, buff, if I remember correctly. And um, as you as a smaller deed owner, if you want to create a situation where you uh, basically pledge your fealty to that king, you guys can work out whatever sort of relationship you would like to work out in exchange to receive that buff. Um, and it's not something that we're necessarily, you know, we're not dictating what anyone has to do, but there may be situations, especially as the world becomes more and more populated, where being allied with a specific monarch in your specific neighborhood might be a really good idea. Um, and not being allied with that monarch might be a particularly bad idea. You know, I mean, you can think of this as, again, as a simulation. And I imagine that there will be, uh, as the as the game expands, as the player base increases, there will end up being geographical lines that get drawn between centers of power. Um, not to be too uh, anthropological about it, but you you might. Will there be mounts? Sauce wants to know. Michael, what do you say? Oh, oh. oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, I I think again, I I want to try to you know simulate a fantasy world here, um, and I want to keep it. But you know, as the game gets launched, guys, you know it's like time goes on and things start to get a little funny or weird. I, I really just want to. I want to prevent that. I find it weird in a game when I go into a town and there's 50 people on mounts and someone's writing like a hippopotamus and someone's writing a, you know, a, a you know, a, a transparent ostrich with sparkles and someone's writing like that just feels very strange to me. Um, you know, over time, content gets pretty out there and crazy because you just want to keep taking it to the next level and maybe the game will turn into that at some point, but. Um, there will definitely be mounts, but I'd like them to be a little bit more like, you know, uh, a war horse, you know, would be an incredible mount with armor on it and things like that. 
Do you remember the mounts in World of Warcraft? I remember one time somebody came through Ironforge with a skeletal mount. Must have been a dev, because I've never seen it again. What what did it look like? I think it, I think it was like like a fiery skeletal mount. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, like I kind of expect. You know, I, I remember in Ultima Online once uh, there was a a trainer that trained a dragon and brought him through town. I never saw that, and everyone was running for their lives, like, oh, my God, holy crap, you know, what happens if he loses control of this thing? Oh, but that's actually a question I wouldn't mean to ask you. That was awesome. I that have my own funny. question, which is, can towns be uh, basically invaded by the, the creatures? The creatures. Um, like, if I, if I place my town too close to... A dangerous area, and I don't have a de enough defensive structures to to protect it. What happens? So I think I think of this as um, the the you know the answer to that is it is a possibility. I believe I, I think it just has to be. And what we would do is we would have a system in place by which there's there's kind of a fear factor you know like if you go out into the woods how often do you actually get to see a a wolf in the woods you know they see you coming far before you see them so i i think that creatures in general aren't going to like big open spaces and walls and they're going to just shy away from it um unless they get really hungry if there's a lot of them they're going to get more bold if they're getting really hungry uh, maybe they even feed on animals that live in the wild, and if the population of the town has taken all their food, then the monsters are going to get really hungry, not have any food. They're going to get more bold, more desperate, and I think you would, you know, start seeing them want to, you know, raid a town. Um, but generally, they're they're going to be, um, they're going to be discouraged by it. Now, let's say you have a let's say you have a citadel. You're gonna have these massive citadel walls. That's gonna be extremely discouraging, and I can't imagine. You know, maybe there'll be a creature or two in the game out of some sort of legendary ancient class that would consider getting near a town like that. Um, uh, but if you have a, you know, if you got a farming or ranching hamlet and you put it near a dungeon, I mean, you're probably, you're probably, you know, you're gonna get some monsters rolling through and and killing some livestock and killing you. Um, that's our, that's our thoughts on that. So, I love it. Know. Cause the first thing I'm, I'm going to try, well, no, I'm thinking, maybe not the first thing, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm imagining there's going to be somebody, maybe not me who does a massive mob train onto somebody's town. Yeah. Leroy Jenkins, like going Leroy Jenkins mode and dragging a train into someone's town would be absolutely hilarious. You know, it's, 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 it's a running, living simulation, guys. Here's another possibility I, I was thinking of the other day, Eric, is what if you find out that there's a specific food that goblins really, really love? Store it up and start stacking it up and putting it in piles. Like, leave a breadcrumb trail for them. You know, you could lead them also into a, into a place or put a okay. pile of it in the center of a village. <laughs> oh, I love that idea. Um, we really want it to be kind of a living sandbox simulation, guys, so... Um, when you're asking questions like, is something possible, it's kind of, it's going to be yes, most all the time, unless we feel it just fundamentally ruins the game. Um, pets is one that comes up a lot, like, hey, can I have pets? Can I, you know, and I think we'll have done an excellent job with the simulation if getting a pet really feels like, you know, winning the love and protection of a stray dog you know, slowly feeding it, getting it closer and closer to the encampment. Um, I got I got one for you that I think is kind of important to, to answer here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stever82 says, man, guys, I really hope you can make this. It sounds cool. Talk, yeah. why don't you share a little bit about your history and maybe explain a little bit why Jason is such a fanboy and has been for many years. Um... So I, I was uh, started my career at Interplay, guys, and was just really fortunate enough to 
work with just amazing, brilliant people at, at Black Isle and Troika. And I got to work on a lot of games in varying capacities. Um, Jason loves Arcanum a lot. Um, I, I think what was important about those years and wasn't almost wasn't the games that I made, but it was the DNA of the people in those studios. Um, and you see it today um, in Obsidian and Fergus and everything those guys have built. You know, they're just, they're trying to build the coolest shit in the universe. And the reason part of the DNA of that time was coming up with extremely efficient ways to get the players in the game and the creatures and NPCs to all be doing radically different things. Really basic sets of data can be applied to, to um, uh, you know, really basic sets of data can be applied to yield an unbelievable amount of, um, of scenarios. Uh, I like to use, I mean, in Temple of Elemental Evil, you know, there's, uh, and Fallout, oh my gosh, like the first Fallout, you know, how many people, you know, that played that game would save their game and then just poke at it to see what happens. Um, I spent way, way, way too much of my life playing that game specifically, that and Arcanum. Like, between the two of those, the sheer depth and beauty of it blows my mind to this day. It's very, it's, it's very light and was possible back then to have a scenario. Let me paint a scenario for you guys. You know, I walk into a bar and stab the bartender. Um, what happens? And depending on your character, your class, how the town thinks of you, your stats, the gear you're carrying, you know, you might, you know, if you might walk into the bar and if you are a really high level character with evil black armor on and you're super powerful and you stab that bartender, you would see every single person flee, including people jumping out a window, you know, to, to try to get out of there. There might be another character that comes in, stabs the bartender, and uh, the entire bar jumps him. Um, you know, you it's 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 very light math to when a character is making a decision to look around in its environment and make a um, make a decision on how it would want to proceed next. So it is my hope to take some of those simple math systems that we had in place and just employ them at a larger scale server side and have it running day and night and have you guys uh, living in it together and poking at it and seeing what happens. Hey, hey, Michael, there's Aces asks, will there be bosses that take server-wide effort to defeat? And before you answer that, I hope the answer is yes. Um, I, so... I like the idea. I don't feel like when I'm playing games these days, guys, I don't feel like a boss is a boss. It's like, yeah, let's run down here and kill this guy four times before we have to log out. That there's nothing boss. That's not a boss. So I think there are going to be bosses in Mirandus that people aren't able to kill for a long time. I mean, there might be bosses that have never been killed. No one knows how to kill them. They're unbelievably powerful. Um, and if you get 10 of your friends together, it's not going to be a simple matter of, you know, a simple matter of, okay, I'm going to run in here. All right, I'm going to drop a root on this guy. And then, you know, hey, you heal me. And then, uh, yeah, we'll take him out. I, I think it's going to be far more complex than that. I think that if you even made it to the boss, you would be some epic level heroes. And when you got there, they're not going to act like anything you've seen before. They will have very complex things that they're thinking about in relationship to, to what's happening. Um, you might get there, see him, and uh, he might sound a horn that none of you knew he even had that summons the entire dungeon to, you know, to, to try to get to him. If you're in there attacking a dungeon... Um, I don't think a boss monster would let you just walk around and slaughter people and clear a dungeon and sit on a chair. Like, that just, I mean, that just doesn't make any sense to me. That also doesn't feel like a boss. Um, 
So I don't know. I mean, we say boss. I would it take a server wide effort to to kill one? I mean, it it's going to take a monstrous effort. Would it need to be server wide? I'm I'm not sure. But part of it is just going to be learning about how to kill it to begin with. I think um, it's not just a matter of uh, grinding a few, you know, grinding its points down with everyone having a you know pretty good DPS. You know, it's there's going to be more to it than that. It might be, you know, there might be bosses, you know, that are intrinsically magical and there might only be times of the year where they're even vulnerable. Something like that, you know. That's a cool, like, you know, having a world where you have to figure out what something's weak points are and share it with everyone and no one really knows and everyone's trying to figure out the puzzle of how to take down something that monolithic. That's a, that's a boss. That's a big boss. So I want it to be special. I want it to be amazing and interesting. And I want it that if a boss is killed, everyone remembers it. Um, probably Miranda's wide. You know, we speaking of bosses, uh, take a look at our Slack channel for sales. We just got a boss come down, throw, threw down uh, uh, point four ETH for 10 potion stands. Mm. Yeah, there's going to be bosses in the world that aren't monsters. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that right now we're on the hour mark, so let's go ahead and get this wrapped up. I'll go ahead and do a drawing. I think we need to do this more often, though. What do you guys think? I think so. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've been I think... so. I think we've been really busy, guys. I mean, we are just cranking away here day and night, and. Um, you know, it's something that we love is connecting up with you guys and giving you that open forum. And it's a part of the DNA of, of what Gala is. So um, we definitely plan on doing this as often as we can. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, it's taken. Um, let's go ahead and do a drawing. I've got everyone that I got that asked a question. I'm sorry if your name is not included here. I know there were some questions asked in text that I couldn't get. So basically, I'm going to drop this in here, and it's going to be whoever comes up first is the one who gets a uh, a crystal with a homestead deed attached to it. So randomize. Someone says they can't hear you. What? It says you're muted. I'm not muted. Feature? I'm really? I shouldn't be. Yeah, people are saying they can't hear you. Uh really? Okay. Well, you can't hear me, so oh, ask a capper can hear me. Mal gets one. Okay. So Everyone <laughs> They're so they're so Are you watching? Evil. Are you watching what's going on in our Slack channel for notification? No, not right now. Dude, it's I have like 80, me 80 new messages. Incredibly popular right now. Wow. Hey, can we, can we, uh, can I throw one more thing out there, guys? To, yeah. to the community? I know it. we're Go past the four o'clock, but this, we had a discussion today about, about this, this topic. Um, and I want to address it a little bit with you guys. There's this risk. There's this risk in Mirandus because the number of buildings and deeds are finite that, you know, let's say there's 300 total potion shops in the world uh, and somebody swoops in and buys 290 of them. Um, that maybe actually would be integrated and 290 would just live and, and on the chain with some guy that is just sitting on a I'm okay with that. I think that sucks, and I think I'd hope we'd have more potion shops in the world, but boy, is that going to make potion shops super special for the two or three or four that make it in there. I mean, a city that has a potion shop or two will become hailed for miles around. Everyone will want to visit there, and that'll become the epicenter for potions. Um, you know, you guys are a part of this living simulation that we're trying to build, and we don't know what you're going to do um, just like we're hoping to not know exactly what, you know, the creatures and the world are, are going to do. Um, so, you know, 
it's it's just it's just a part of building this together with you guys and and a risk that the blockchain kind of brings in but i think any time that you're trying to control something or wrap your fingers around it too tightly you're playing you're just kind of playing the wrong game and thinking the wrong way it's more about what would the options look like in a world where someone's sitting on most of them and there are only two or three out there um I'm more interested in in seeing what you guys would do and how the world would shape up in that scenario um, than I am trying to throttle, you know, we're not interested in throttling your behavior. We're interested in letting this catch fire and see how the world sorts out. Okay, excellent. And uh, we'll, we're going to try to schedule these a little bit more frequently, and we're going to try to pick them in some – next time we'll do something maybe in the morning so that it works out better for uh, people who are in time zones that are not on this side of the planet. And, uh, yeah, so thank you very much, and we will well, can, catch can up. We, can we call it, uh, Jason, the, the – was it large potion shop that sold out in – yeah, that's what that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing and four minutes. Yeah, that's uh that's pretty impressive. And and it it um, there is going to be some of these that we will we will list for sale later. But we just wanted to you know kind of help make sure there was a little bit of a a wider uh, distribution. Um, so there you go. Actually, oh man, old man Smithers, you're right. I didn't. I've been streaming it, but I don't think I recorded it. So maybe it won't be posted to YouTube. This might have you might might all be special ones who got to hear it, but I'll make sure the next one does. Oh, did you give the give it a, the um, reward away? Did something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to Mal. Mal won it. So. Oh, um, Mal! Right on. Yeah. <laughs> so so that'll that'll be a good thing for uh, for him. Oh, by the way, guys, I just talked to the Brave people. There's still nine of the crystals that are available from Brave. Okay, I thought they were sold out. Um, but they are not. So there are still nine of them available from Brave. Unfortunately, they only ship uh, domestically, so they're only for in the United States. But um, there's nine of those that are available. So uh, if you're interested, go to store.brave.com and grab yours. Um, I don't think they're going to be there for very much longer. So yeah, somebody well, buy one for me. We, <laughs> they're so you, cool, you man. Buy one, I mean. Man? You focused lasers um, you know i don't know Come on, i'd feel it's... i'd feel bad i'd feel bad <laughs> it's, it's it's i bought one i i don't feel even a little bit bad but then i did give it away so you know it's an amazing it. process it's really cool i wish i had one of those machines in the house this was super fun guys yeah, I, I yeah think this is great do this at least once a week okay okay well let's uh we'll plan the next one um let's how do you feel about well we'll we'll, we'll schedule it and we'll do a, a series of announcements um but i want to start getting some other other people on i'd like to get one of the the guys from polyant on as well maybe and and you know some of our other ecosystem partners well when we have uh that game that we've been talking about internally go live we'll bring those guys on too yeah for sure for sure okay guys i'm gonna kill it thank you so much we love you all, and uh, we'll talk to you.